Hello all, my name is Ben Feltz. I'm a student in Dr. Wu's uh, EEE 6512 image processing class at the University of Florida, and I'm going to be giving a presentation on the analysis of common, of common filtering techniques in vehicle tracking. So before we get into how to apply a common filter to track vehicles, let's first answer the question, how do we track objects in general? Um, there's a number of different objects we can track. Really, anything that's moving can be trackable. But for instance, you know, can we track a soccer ball that's being kicked by someone from Manchester United? Can we track this baseball here that's being thrown by a pitcher? Or can we tr track vehicles from a surveillance video? So all these things can be tracked, but how do we track objects? Well, one method that we can use is what's called foreground detection. Now, I want you to imagine that you're in a baseball field. Uh, the stands are empty. There's nothing in, in the field uh, except a cannon that's going to shoot uh, the baseball. So you launch the baseball, and you want to track it. Well, our eyes can obviously track where the ball is just because our brains do all the processing. But imagine you have a camera, and you have the ca camera. It's stationary, and then you see the ball move across the field of view. Now, obviously, you and I can look at the video and track the ball with our eyes, but how do you get a computer to do it? Well, one technique you can use is what's called foreground detection. Now, simply put, a foreground detector uh, takes a video and ignores anything that's not moving. So, for instance, uh, the field, the lines on the field, the empty stands, all those will be ignored except the parts where the ball is moving. Now, once all those are, are ignored, we can we would get locations in each frame of the video of where the ball is because uh, it's patches where there's a moving object. And so after this is done, after we have for each frame a section of the video that's moving, we can use what's called blob detection. And the simplest way to understand this is it's just a centroiding algorithm to help us find the center of the object. Now once we've done that, we will be able to track things that move. Uh, for instance, again, if the ball was shot from the cannon, our algorithm would process out all the stadium, all the field, and just find the ball and see, okay, the ball was at this point in frame one, in frame two it's here, in frame three, so on and so forth. And again, we can extrapolate this further to, say, a soccer ball. Say that, again, a player from Manchester United kicks the soccer ball. We can use a technique like that to see where the ball goes down the field, and the same uh, for the surveillance video video. And, you know, to, to point your attention to the surveillance video, um, obviously the car in, a, in about the center, it's obviously moving, but the rest of the scenery isn't moving. Oh, we have parked cars, we have trees, sidewalks, but the car is what's moving. And because of that, we can filter out everything that's not moving and track that car if you wish. But there's a few problems with this. Um, the first off is our camera, well, you know, our camera might be shaky. If the camera is shaky, then obviously the background can be shaky. And while we're able to take care of this with algorithms, it introduces noise to the system. There's also, of course, uh, image noise from you know additive white Gaussian noise or other types of noise that affect the quality. And also, we might have something called data dropout. And here's what I mean by data dropout. Suppose that we're recording our baseball going through the air, uh, but the video blanks out for a few seconds and then comes back on. Well, uh, once the video comes back on and the algorithm starts, we can again track where the ball was, but, but during that time that we didn't see anything, we can't track the ball. If we got no data, if we didn't receive any images, we won't know where the ball was. In, and in some cases, that might be important to us. So this method of object tracking works, and we can produce results. We can find error rates. We can do all these things, but it has some flaws intrinsic with any algorithm. But the next question is, well, why not use math? Whether it's a baseball, a car, or really anything, an object's motion can be tracked by a set of physics equations. Just like you learned in your high school or undergraduate in your physics career, we can model the movement of an object. Using you know, Newton's equations, you know, going back to the baseball, the, the baseball should have a parabolic path that, you know, that we can calculate, you know, knowing the mathematical model. Since we know how the ball should move, shouldn't we be able to predict where it is? 
I mean, it'll take some time because we need to know where the ball is and we need to calculate initial velocity to go into right equations. But after that, we should be able to perfectly plot where the ball is. Well, like any algorithm, it has some issues. Uh, the, the first problem with using a mathematical model is it might not be detailed enough. And here's an example. Uh, say that um, say that it's a windy day, and say that you know I shoot my baseball, and um, a gust of wind comes and blows it off course. Now, if I were using foreground detec detection, I would be able to see this, and I and I could track it. But with mathematical model, it can't predict those random gusts of wind. Or maybe a different side of that problem, um, the mathematical model again might not have enough detail in the sense that uh, it might not factor in things like air resistance or or any sort of little factors that we don't know enough that make our model flawed. And this also, using the mathematical model, it doesn't factor in noise. So it's not a bad to use the model, but again, it has some problems. And both the foreground detector and the mathematical model and the mathematical model. They have their strengths, but they also have some weaknesses. But here's the thing, why not use both? You know, Im imagine this. We're trying to track the movement of the ball. Why not use both sets of information? Because logically, that would that would help us. If, if I use foreground detector and I get a measurement of where the ball is, that's useful data to me. But I also know that the ball moves uh, along a path that's guided by mathematical equations, and that's important information as well, so why not use both? Well, that has been done, and it's what's called a common filter. A common filter takes the measurement data, or the data the foreground detector gives us, and the, and the mathematical model, and it, you know takes into account the covariance of the system, and it generates the predicted data. Basically what it does is it takes the two sets of data, looks at the amount of noise in the system and says, all right, which data set do I trust more, and takes a little bit of a weighted average, which we'll see in the next slide. This presentation will continue in the next video.